Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke. I'm the Australian Biocommons Training Manager and I'll be your host for today. This webinar is part of a series in which we share useful information about the latest digital te techniques, data and tools for the life sciences community. Each month we hear from local and international experts who present on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help you deliver your best environmental, agricultural and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest news and events from the Biocommons by following us on LinkedIn or X or checking out our YouTube channel. Before we begin today, we will pause to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Turrbal and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Mallory Freeberg to speak to us about global data resources for human genomics and health. Mallory is the human genomics team leader at Amble EBI and sees herself as a connector, enabling the fantastic work of the curators, software engineers, and project leads that develop the Institute's resources. She supports the delivery of open data resources such as Ensemble and Decipher and has extensive expertise on, with working with sensitive human data through her experience with the European Genome Phenome Archive, the Human Cell Atlas Project and her involvement in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Welcome to the webinar, Mallory. We're really looking forward to hearing more about these global resources and I'll hand straight over to you to get us started. Great. Um, as Melissa mentioned, um, I'm happy to be here today to talk about um, some of the global data resources for human genomics and health um, that are available here at EMBL EBI. And just to get started, for those um, who are not familiar with the EBI, we are one of the six sites of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, which is a not-for-profit research organization um, funded by nearly 30 member states across Europe. And uh, EMBL is Europe's life science research organization. Uh, at EBI, we have a more of a focus on bioinformatics and managing big data for the life sciences. In addition to hosting a dozen or so different research groups at EBI, we also manage more than 40 open data resources that are used by millions and millions of scientists and researchers around the world. EBI is the second largest of the six EMBL sites. Uh, the main site and the administrative center for EMBL are located in Heidelberg. There are structural biology labs um, located in Hamburg and Grenoble. Uh, there's epigenetics and neuroscience at the site in Rome. And, and bioinformatics is, of course, the focus of the site in Hingston, the UK, which is where I'm based. And we have our newest site uh, in Barcelona, and they focus on areas of tissue biology, organoids, and disease modeling. There are uh, about 1,900 staff members um, across all of the EMBL sites, um, and about 800 of those uh, work with me at the EBI. Uh, I mentioned that uh, EMBL is made up of um, 29 different member states, so those countries are listed here on the left, as well as the year that they joined EMBL. Um, so they contribute funding to the running of EMBL, and then they benefit from various programs um, and services and I'm also happy to say that um, Australia is an associate member um, of EMBL, has been since 2008, um, also contributing some funds and being able to benefit from some of the services provided by EMBL. Uh, EMBL has, or EBI has five uh, key missions described here. So of course, one of our main missions is to manage and deliver uh, freely to, to everyone. Uh, a set of data resources and other bioinformatics tools and services. Um, but we also have a commitment to doing um, investigator-driven high-quality research across about a dozen different uh, research groups. And we also have a huge focus on training. Um, so the EBI has a dedicated training team um, that runs all kinds of in-person courses and, on, and online webinars, um, again, to train sort of the next generation of scientists in a lot of these bioinformatics um, tools and services. We also actively engage with industry partners to make sure that the research that we're doing and supporting can be translated 
um, into improving things like human health. And then finally, we have a large role in just generally coordinating bioinformatics across Europe. We do this a number of ways, uh, one of which is by, by being um, a node in the Elixir network, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but Elixir is essentially a, a life sciences infrastructure across Europe. Um, it's just thing, things like uh, managing data resources, doing training, um, things like that. So here is uh, an overview of all of the resources, um, over 40 of them that are available at EBI, and they're divided along different uh, themes. So I'm not gonna read through them all, but even just looking at some of these, you probably recognize one or two resources that you've used um, in your research or in your work. Um, and today I'm gonna highlight and uh, focus on four of these in the context of uh, human genomics at EBI. So I'll start with the first one, uh, which is Ensemble. Um, so I'm sure many of you have probably been to or are familiar with the Ensemble Genome Browser. Uh, this is a screenshot of the main website where you can find information about vertebrate genomes. Um, but I'll also call out specifically, we're in the middle of a project to revamp the entire Ensemble Genome Browser. Um, so you're more than welcome to go here. This is uh, beta.ensemble.org is where you can find the site. Um, it doesn't have all the full functionality yet, still in beta, but you're welcome to um, check it out, um, do your normal activities, and provide feedback. There are surveys that are going out around all the time to help uh, improve um, the beta site for next release, so you're very welcome to check that out. Um, but stepping back a bit, what exactly is Ensemble and what does the Genome Browser do? Um, essentially, we all know that the current sort of representation of a reference genome is a linear sequence of letters, um, but that itself doesn't really have much meaning. It's all of the annotations and um, the different genomic features that we overlay on top of this sequence that really provides the context for understanding um, our research. Um, and so this is what Ensemble does, is it essentially adds value to that linear reference by bringing together both information that uh, we Ensemble generate, but also that we bring in from a wide range of external um, sources into the single um, browser, browser site. We have the main Ensemble site now for vertebrate genomes and a sister site for non-vertebrates, but this will all be merged into one um, site when we release the new site. And you also may have used um, similar resources such as the UCSC Genome Browser or the Genome Data Viewer um, based uh, or run by the NIH. Um, we all do similar things and we all collaborate on different projects to make sure that we're just basically providing um, the best reference um, annotations um, for your research. Here are some of the uh, features that we provide as part of Ensemble. So of course, of course we provide the reference genomes themselves along with um, all of the annotated genes um, right now for over 300 species, um, but I will highlight that um, we have a rapid release ensemble site at the moment that is rapidly releasing, as the name implies, uh, thousands of genome references for a lot of species that are being sequenced as part of these large biodiversity projects, which unfortunately I won't have time to get into today, um, but just to, know, just to know that those reference genomes are being released with minimal annotations um, to support research in those areas. We also produce and overlay um, genetic variation data across these genomes um, that we bring in from other sources, as well as um, comparative genomics data, um, such as um, alignments of gene families, looking at gene trees or homologs across species. We provide uh, gene regulatory information, so things like looking at chromatin state or histone modification marks on the, on the reference genome. Um, in terms of tools, um, one of our more popular tools is Biomart which is a uh, bulk download tool where you can download information that you are viewing in Ensemble and you can export it in your flat file format of choice um, to upload into your own workflows. We also uh, develop and maintain uh, tools for data processing, including the very popular Ensemble Variant Effect Predictor or VEP, which I'll talk about more in the next slide um, for predicting the effects of variants. We allow you to upload and display your own data and in addition to the web-based um, views, there's also programmatic access to most of these tools and resources via APIs. Again, so you can incorporate them into your own uh, local workflows. And then all of the data and um, software that we build for Ensemble is open source and available in a few different locations. 
I wanted to specifically highlight the Ensemble of Variant Effect Predictor tool because it is so important in the area of human genomics for things like understanding um, genetic variation in the context of um, uh, clinical diagnoses. So um, this tool essentially takes in uh, reference data. So these are things like um, annotated transcripts from Ensemble, but also from other sources like RefSeq, uh, bringing in um, identified or observed variants from different resources around the world, uh, regulatory features, and also um, disease phenotype mappings. And on the left-hand side here, you can see just some of the resources that this VEP tool um, brings in. Um, as well as on the right, we've started to bring in um, things like um, predictive scores. Um, so, um, excuse me, I didn't close this. Yep. So things like predicting um, the effects of variants or predicting pathogenicity of, of variants. Um, and this tool brings in all these uh, different external resources. And what you submit is one or more variants that you want to find information about. And the tool outputs or annotates um, all of this information on your chosen variant. So the little bar at the bottom um, is an example of just a few of the outputs you would get by using the VEP tool. Um, there's both a web-based version of this tool you can use, um, as well as um, an API version that you can use to uh, incorporate into um, your workflows. Uh, and so this is the uh, Ensemble team. It's quite large. Um, we have um, uh, many funders that help make this work possible. And I'll be pausing after each of these um, resources to show the acknowledgments. Otherwise, the acknowledgment slide is just going to be very, very large. Um, so that's that's the Ensemble team. Uh, I'm now going to move into talking about the Decipher platform. So Ensemble is really um, mostly used in the context of academic research. Um, but the Decipher platform is unique in that it's um, a web-based platform that helps clinicians and clinical research teams to understand variants and assess assess pathogenicity and um, also allows the sharing, limited sharing of patient data um, to help in um, the diagnostic journey for patients. And it does this by integrating both genetic and phenotypic data uh, to provide the genomic uh, context around a variant and helping to understand the consequence of that variant on the patient's health and disease. Um, this is the a screenshot of the main uh, web page, so you can get there by going to decipherdenomics.org. Um, and Decipher is actually celebrating its um, being around for 20 years this year. And the initial need for Decipher arose um, by the fact that um, when patients go into a clinic to try to get a diagnosis, uh, often part of that journey is having um, a genetic test done. So this can be um, a genetic panel or more recently um, getting things like whole exome or whole genome sequencing done. And this is done in clinical genetics laboratories, which are spread out across the world. Um, this is just a sort of a representation of that. Uh, but that data tends to stay in those clinical labs um, and only used, only shared with the clinician as, um, as part of the diagnostic journey. But there's actually value in sharing that information um, within a, in a very safe setting. And this is especially true for the rare disease case where a clinician may only see a particular patient with a rare disease once in their lifetime. Um, but if they know that that um, that a patient with that same disease is being seen by another clinician, they can share knowledge and potentially help with the treatment or management of that disease. So the Decipher platform was set up to provide a safe way to share um, these limited variants and um, phenotypic information in order to help with um, with the diagnosis. And um, similar to Ensemble, bringing in a lot of additional value for the reference genome. Decipher also brings in additional reference information to help with the understanding of those variants. And there are um, similar initiatives around the world that are doing um, things like Decipher is doing. And it was recognized that there was be power in connecting these resources up in um, a network to, to further um, uh, enable the sharing of uh, uh, patient information or, or sharing information to enable patient matching. Um, and so there was a project set up called the Matchmaker Exchange, which connected these resources in the network. Um, and this is also uh, Matchmaker Exchange is a driver project for something called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or G4GH. There's a little sort of badge in the corner. I will talk a bit more about this later, um, but in short, this is a global initiative um, which is uh, driving the development and adoption of both um, data and technical standards 
as well as policies to enable the integration of genomic data into uh, medicine and healthcare practice. Um, and so this is a, a matchmaker exchange is, is um, dedicated to ensuring that these standards get developed and, and implemented. And I'll, I'll speak a bit more about this later as well. Um, there's just some numbers here about um, what kind of data uh, are in the Decipher platform. Um, but I wanted to highlight on the right the fact that there are over 320 different depositing centers across the globe, uh, actually within 45 different countries that have clinicians who are actively depositing um, some of their patient data into the platform to enable um, those connections. And in fact, the lines you see on the graph in the middle, uh, or sorry, the, the map in the middle, um, the darker colored countries are ones with these depositing centers, these clinical genetics laboratories. Um, the lines are showing where um, connections are being made between two different clinicians who have deposited information for two different patients in the platform that have matched um, on um, uh, the genes that are affected um, uh, as part of these clinical these clinical genetics tests and have similar phenotypes. And the clinicians are contacting each other to learn more about their cases uh, to help me, help uh, provide a better patient care. And so Decipher is not only enabling a clinician to understand their variant better, but is also enabling these connections to be made, which is pretty cool. Um, so what does Decipher actually show? Um, there's a lot in the platform, so if you're interested at all in it, I highly recommend checking out the website, but I'll just cover a few things that the Decipher platform um, shows. So within the platform, we support the submission of um, many different types of genetic variation, both coding and non-coding, variants in the nuclear and mitochondrial genome. Um, and these variants are displayed in um, a table similar to what you would see here, where each row is a variant um, and there's some annotation information um, and links to other pages um, in the Decipher platform with more information. So some of these include things like there's um, a genome browser, so very similar to Ensemble in the Decipher platform. If you can see um, towards the Right here, there's a vertical gray bar um, highlighting where the variant is that the clinician has submitted. And you can see thing like, things like the gene context, so if it hits in a coding or non-coding region. Um, here I'm showing a regulatory track, so you can see if it falls into an, like an enhancer or promoter region. I'm only showing a few different tracks here, but there are, are dozens to choose from, and you can customize your own view um, to, again, to see the genetic uh, context of your variant. Decipher also um, encourages this, the submission of phenotypes associated with the patient. And these are terms chosen from the human phenotype ontology. So it's really important again here to use standard terms to describe these. Um, so you can see here um, uh, six different uh, phenotypes submitted for this patient. It also allows the submission of uh, phenotypes for the parents if they're known. Um, and on the right here, we're seeing um, the mapping of a patient's uh, measurements, in this case, um, uh, weight um, over the course of development. Um, so in addition to rare diseases, um, the Decipher platform was initially driven by the need to support the diagnosis of developmental disorders in children. Um, and so things like measuring height, weight, and head circumference are really important for tracking um, the growth, the development and growth um, of a child. So here you can look at where your patient's particular measurements line up within the expected range, uh, which can be helpful for um, understanding, um, for, for diagnosing the patient. We also provide, um, Decipher provides protein context for variants. Um, so this is a protein view page, um, where in the middle you can see sort of a two-dimensional structure of the protein with functional domains highlighted and the tracks immediately above and below show where there have been variants identified in that protein, either from um, within the Decipher platform on the top or from uh, ClinVar, which is based in the US at the bottom. Um, again, to see uh, what known variants there are in this particular protein. There's lots of other information here that's useful, um, but I'll also highlight that you can click on these domains and you can view interactive 3D structures of the protein. So here's one uh, from the PDB um, repository. And we've also recently been incorporating uh, predicted structures. So for example, those from AlphaFold, um, and you can zoom in and out of these structures as well to see where on the protein 3D structure um, your variant is located, if it's a, if it's a coding uh, variant. 
We also have a dedicated view on the outputs of the Ensemble VEP tool that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is a more graphical display. Um, and so th this is for, um, oh, this, this page here is for a particular variant. Um, and it's a, it's a missense variant. So you can see here we show um, what the output of the amino acid substitution is. Um, and we also show um, what the predicted consequences are. So here's a pie chart um, showing the percentage of the different types of um, um, effects that that particular variant has. And then the bottom, there's a, a longer table here, again, showing more information about the consequences um, of that variant, including um, other annotations uh, from other resources. Um, this cipher also supports uh, matching patients. Um, for the case where um, a patient who has had their data deposited has consented to be matched um, and only shown sort of aggregated information. So this view here is a view on a gene. Um, so it's it's per gene. And I, as a clinician, have put in a variant for my patient, which hits a particular gene. And I can see here, I can see here, um, what information Decipher has about other patients who also have hits in that same gene. Um, so the pie charts here, the one on the far left, for example, shows a distribution of the different types of consequences of variants in that same gene from other patients in the platform. Um, there's about 21% that are likely loss of function and the remaining are likely protein, uh, protein coding changing. On the far right is a pie chart showing the distribution of the predicted pathogenicity of that variant. Um, in terms of uh, bringing those annotations from uh, from other resources. Um, and then there's also phenotypes listed with these um, little bar charts below the pie charts. Um, and the really interesting bit at the bottom, so um, this table is showing um, just the top two of a set of other patients. So there's one row per patient here that have also had a variant in the same gene. Um, so it's not really, it's not showing any patient identifiable information, but just that there is a patient in Decipher with a hit in the same gene. Um, and in the far right, you can see the overlap of the phenotypes. So between the phenotypes of the patient I've submitted this data for and the one that's being matched. And if I as a clinician think this is interesting, so if there's a high overlap of um, matched phenotypes for variants in the same gene, you can see a little um, envelope icon here, which means that clinician has consented to being contacted um, to discuss their case further. So I could click that button and Decipher would enable a communication to be started between the two clinicians to further discuss the cases. Um, and all of this is very useful for both informing and helping with the diagnosis, but also identifying um, new uh, disease gene associations. So I've shown a lot of um, uh, genetic and, and phenotypic and protein information here. But Decipher also helps with linking to external resources to support disease management. So I'll just highlight here um, links for, again, this is a gene page, and um, it's linking out to these um, ClinGen clinical actionability reports. These are curated reports of known gene disease um, links and information about the outcomes of interventions um, for that those uh, gene disease links. So again, a clinician can come here if they're looking for a starting point for information about how to um, treat their patient. So, so far, I, I hope I've showed you um, just um, a bit how we can take um, genomic data and actually start to use that to um, help inform the diagnosis um, of patients by integrating um, phenotypic and genotypic information, looking at these in the context of amino acid and protein changes, enabling the matching of patients both within Decipher, but also through the Matchmaker Exchange Program. And I didn't show it, um, but we also linked to a lot of literature at different points of the platform. And we've also recently been linking to um, functional study data, which can also be useful to inform the uh, um, effect of, of variants. And finally, we can link out to um, additional resources to help with patient management. So this is the amazing Decipher team, both the leadership team and the core team managing the resource. 
And I'd also like to shout out to the uh, patients and families who have enabled their or allowed their data to be shared in the platform, which really um, is what's adding value value there. Um, so the third platform that I wanted to mention was the European Genome Phenome Archive. Um, so to so far, I've talked about an open resource um, ensemble, a resource that um, shares limited information to cipher. But we also know that there's um, lots of programs being started to do whole genome sequencing on large populations. And when we talk about things like whole genome data, um, there, there's more of a potential here um, if this data are exposed uh, to be harmful for an individual. Um, but as humans, we all have the right to uh, protect our personal data and mitigate these risks. And governments have also recognized this right and have um, codified this by passing uh, different legislation that um, puts these um, data protection rights into law. So the EU's uh, General Data Protection Regulation is one good example of this. Um, and in the US, they have HIPAA as well. But of course, protecting the data, meaning it's not um, shared openly, does inhibit its reuse um, and inhibit the potential value it has to secondary research purposes. So we really want a way to be able to balance both um, the need to protect individuals' data, but also um, maximize the value of these uh, research outputs. And so uh, one way we can do this is by enabling the sharing safely of this type of data. And the European Genome Phenome Archive, uh, or the EGA, does this by serving as a permanent archive for sharing this personally identifiable genetic, phenotypic, and clinical data that has been generated for the purposes of research projects and in the context of research-focused healthcare systems. So the EGA was launched at EBI in 2008, and in 2013, uh, we entered into a formal collaboration with our colleagues at the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona, Spain, to co-manage the resource. Um, the EGA is also a G4JH driver project. There's that badge again. Um, and we are also, the EGA is also um, noted as a core data resource for um, Elixir. Uh, here's the main um, web page, and you can reach it by going to ega-archive.org. Um, I'll briefly review the EGA data access model, which is important because it's a controlled access resource. So it starts off by um, a researcher having generated um, human data that needs to be um, restricted in who it can be shared with. Um, and so they they produce this data, they perhaps write a paper, and they want to submit the uh, paper, so they uh, need to submit their data to a repository to make it shareable. So they reach out to the EGA, um, and they sign a data processing agreement with the EGA, which um, in, outlines the roles and responsibility of the EGA as a processor, which means they act on behalf of the data owners to only share the data with the individuals that the data owners say it can be shared with. Then another scientist comes along, um, finds the data set in a publication. The data set looks interesting. They want to access it um, to use it for their own research. Um, so then they contact, not, not the EGA, because um, the EGA doesn't control access, but they contact the data, uh, well, it's called a data controller in GDPR terms, the data owner. And this is often a committee of people um, called a data access committee who make decisions on whether a researcher can use the data for the uh, purposes they want to use it for. And they, um, if they agree that they can use the data, um, a data access agreement is signed between the researcher and the DAC. The DAC informs the EGA that they approve this researcher for access to this particular data. And then the EGA enables that data to be downloaded by the researcher. Um, to date, the EGA contains over 20 petabytes of data. Um, on the left-hand side is showing the number of studies published with EGA data over time. These are non-cumulative graphs, so you can see there continue to be more and more um, data sets published at the EGA, which is great. And then as an indicator of the impact, on the right-hand side, you can see a graph of the number of publications citing already published EGA data. So these are groups that have found data in EGA, have gotten access, and reused it for their own research. And this number also continues to grow um, year over year, which is really great to see. Although the EGA is um, managed, it teams in the UK and Spain, um, it actually has a global community of users, 
Um, so on the right, you can see a distribution by country of um, researchers who are submitting their data to the EGA um, to enable its reuse. And on the left, a distribution of people requesting data from the EGA to use um, uh, for their work. Um, although the US and the UK are sort of the two bigger players by number of people, if you read through the list, you'll see um, countries represented from all over the world, um, including Australia, who were also in the top of both of these lists, which is very nice. Um, to date, a lot of the studies that have been published in the EGA have been sort of like single research studies. Um, but of course, we're seeing a growth in the number of um, nationally funded and driven genomic uh, sequencing projects. Um, so sequencing hundreds of thousands or millions of citizens in different regions uh, to develop things like biobanks. So you might have heard of the UK biobank or the Estonia biobank. Um, and many of these programs, um, well, actually, over a third of them, 37%, are doing this sort of sequencing in the context of wanting to drive personalized or precision medicine. So specifically using these data in a healthcare context. And um, nearly all of them um, have identified this personalized medicine as uh, a potential use case in the future. And with the data being generated in, in um, more of a healthcare context, there do come with that more restrictions on how and where the data can be shared. Um, oftentimes, or in some of these countries, the data can't actually leave um, the national borders, which again, can be a restriction on how the data can be uh, reused. Um, to make sure that the data do remain valuable, there have been some initiatives set up. Uh, for example, in Europe, the One Plus Million Genomes Initiative to set a vision and a way forward to enable the global sharing of these um, large uh, large data studies. And so the One Plus Million Genomes Initiative specifically is aimed at um, setting up infrastructure to allow um, this genomics data um, to be shared, um, not just across Europe, but globally. Um, and also with the corresponding clinical data, again, driving towards this idea of um, supporting personalized medicine. Um, and in fact, the EGA had been thinking about this um, before the One Plus Million Genomes Initiative started um, and identifying a way to federate the services that we provide, um, again, to enable the discovery and access to human data, not just within Europe, but globally, while respecting these national data protection regulations which were starting to be established. And ultimately, this is all towards the same goal of accelerating both disease research, um, but also using this data using this genomics data to understand and improve uh, human health. So in uh, 2022, um, the Federal EGA collaboration was officially launched um, with the signing of uh, collaboration agreements between what we now call the Central EGA, which are those sites in the UK and Spain, and five national nodes, national EGA nodes set up in Spain, Germany, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. And um, they agreed to set up a network whereby data would be deposited locally by researchers in their own countries to archives in those countries. But there would be a sharing of public metadata between all the nodes to enable um, uh, one way to discover data across all the nodes. And then you would go to that node to access the data. Um, so this is what FEDER EGA looks like um, to date. Um, you can see uh, the map on the right, um, which is zoomed in on Europe, uh, has the two central nodes in the UK and Spain. And the darker colored countries are those that have signed up and are part of the FEDER EGA um, network. And the countries with the little blue disks um, already have data deposited in their nodes country, um, which then can be discovered across the entire network. And you'll also see that the little, little Elixir logo is located next to some of these nodes. Um, so there's a really strong partnership between um, Elixir, the life sciences infrastructure across Europe, um, and setting up uh, FEDERI EGA to support the sharing of data. Um, although the E in EGA uh, technically stands for European, on the left you'll see a map where there's other countries outside of Europe um, that are actively engaged in setting up uh, a federal EGA node. Um, in particular, Canada and Australia are quite far ahead. Um, and this involves setting up both technical infrastructure as well as the governance around how the data can be shared. Um, but EGA is, or federal EGA is engaged with groups in Latin and South America, um, as well as Africa at the moment, um, and looking at um, getting them on board into the network as well. 
underlying all of this work is the need to be able to interoperate. Um, so to talk to each other, not just interoperate with the data across the different nodes, but also the nodes actually talking to each other, um, their technical infrastructures talking to each other, um, but also interoperating with other projects um, popping up across the world that are doing similar things so that all the data can be discovered and accessed um, by everyone that needs to. And so key to this are making sure that um, we're all using the same standards, uh, data standards, um, metadata standards, technical standards, policy standards. Um, and this is one big reason why the, the Global Alliance um, came to be um, and why it's so important. Um, we actually had a plenary meeting this week, which is another reason why I'm here in Australia this week. Um, the screenshot here just shows um, just a couple of the standards that are being implemented and driven uh, by the EGA. Um, and as I mentioned, the EGA is a driver project and um, all the driver projects for G4G have committed um, to both helping develop and adopt uh, many of these standards as they need uh, to ensure that the different projects are uh, interoperable with each other. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge all of the fantastic groups that have been involved in setting up um, the initial federal EGA. Um, we also have, um, there's nodes in Poland and Portugal that are online at the moment, and we look forward to onboarding um, many other nodes um, in the coming years. Um, and this is the fantastic team of which I used to be a part, so I'm a little biased, um, who manage and run the EGA core resource in both the UK and Spain. Okay, uh, one more resource left um, that I'm going to talk about today, and um, I have to caveat this with um, this project only started a month or two ago, so I don't have much to talk about, but I find it really interesting, um, which is why I wanted to share it. And this is a project um, being done through um, Open Targets, which um, if you're not sure what Open Targets is, um, it's a large scale private uh, public partnership um, that is aiming to make use of human genomics data for the systematic identification and prioritization of drug targets. Um, so the private partners in this partnership are, are mostly pharmaceutical companies um, that have identified that they you know, have the resources um, to set up um, uh, platforms to enable um, these uh, identification and prioritization of drug targets. But there's also value in these for um, the public. Um, so that's why this sort of a public-private partnership. And I won't really talk about the Open Targets platform itself. You should definitely check it out if this is interesting for you. Um, but one of the things that Open Targets also does is fund research projects, um, looking at other areas that they could develop or people could develop uh, to bring into the platform. Um, so we were awarded one of these projects, and it just started um, a couple of months ago to build something called a perturbation catalog. Um, and so this catalog aims to bring in, will integrate. Um, data from different types of uh, functional genetic screens and other types of perturbation experiments where you, for example, um, vary every nucleotide in a gene sequence and you perform some functional assays such as looking at cell growth or maybe a reporter assay um, to start to understand the effect of that variant. And so the, the value here is you don't have to actually observe that variant um, in in real life, you can um, just create it and then do some screenings to understand the effects. Um, and so these data types include, um, well, the experiments include uh, CRISPR screens, for example, or multiplex assays of variant effects, um, or uh, one of the newer ones, PerturbSeq, uh, which is looking at um, the effects of these perturbations on gene expression profiles at the single cell level. And so this project aims to bring all this data together into a catalog that's browsable um, and then in true EBI fashion, we will bring in additional value from other resources to help annotate and understand and interpret these results and then share these data back out um, both to the Open Targets platform. Um, and then I wanted to highlight a key collaboration here um, with the MAVDB resource, uh, which is run here at uh, the WEHI Institute. Um, and this brings in um, this MAV style data, curates it, harmonizes it. Um, because these data sets tend to exist sort of in isolation across different publications. And so MAVTB is really um, this great community-led resource for bringing all of these um, data sets together and make them um, accessible. Um, so again, I don't have anything to show per se, but if this is uh, interesting to you, then um, be on the lookout for the next 
Uh, well, we hope to have an MVP version released in about a year, um, which would be really exciting. Um, but I will acknowledge um, the team as it's set up already, who have started to do preliminary work and map out um, our roadmap for the next year. Um, and then you can see the, um, the uh, private partners um, listed on the right hand side here. Um, so I just reviewed um, three, also new uh, resource, um, but really what makes these human genomics and health data resources truly global? Um, as I mentioned, they're all um, based at the EBI. And it really is the fact that um, we, uh, as the teams building these resources, are um, active participants in many global initiatives and collaborative projects, um, and also always have an eye that these resources um, are used by a global sets of users of, around the world, from different backgrounds, um, with different experiences and different needs. And so they have to be global to be able to serve um, all of our users. And we do this a number of ways, but again, I just wanted to highlight um, the partnership with um, the Elixir, uh, with, with Elixir. Um, so both Ensemble and EGA are, are uh, core data resources as part of Elixir. Um, so they've been um, noted for their importance for life science research. Uh, Elixir also has a very uh, strong collaboration with Australian BioCommons. We do staff exchanges and partner very closely on lots of things. Um, and then there's also um, a strategic partnership between Elixir and uh, G4GH which I have talked about many times, but just to reiterate, um, this is um, a standards development and policy making uh, group that has members um, of, oh, I don't know how many countries, nearly 50 countries uh, representing all different areas um, of, um, of clinical uh, applications. Um, the EGA and the Matchmaker Exchange, as I mentioned, are driver projects for G4GH. Um, we're also members of um, many of these communities of interest. So we have um, similar um, interest in um, uh, driving rare disease and cancer use cases. Um, and then GA4GH is also um, strategically partnered with, as I mentioned, Elixir and also some other um, global groups. Um, so just to reiterate that I've presented a lot here and there are a ton of people behind um, all of this work. So just to acknowledge and, and thank them. Um, and then I also wanted to thank Australian BioCommons for inviting me to present today, um, especially Bernie for the invitation, um, Melissa, Christina, and Jess for getting me set up um, correctly. Um, and I am happy to take um, any questions as long as my voice holds out. Okay, so we'll start with a, a fairly general question here. What do you think is on the horizon for human genomics resources globally? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't really, I didn't have time to talk about it. Um, but one big area of focus um, that's already starting, and I think it will be just becoming more and more important, um, is the the generation of these um, pan genome references uh, for different populations across the world. Um, pan genomes is not exclusive to human genomics. There's other um, life science areas that are making use of pan genomes. Um, but it really, really is important, especially if we want to talk about the application of genomic science to medicine, um, because understanding, because the current reference has many limitations, one of which is it's it's mostly made of one individual um, and it's not very diverse. And so what we think of as like a normal or a reference genome is really not normal or a good reference for most people in the world. Um, so projects like um, the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium, which is a U.S.-based project um, to build a pangenome reference um, of U.S. individuals, but from like diverse backgrounds within the U.S. Um, but there's similar pangenome projects happening across the globe. Um, I don't actually have a number of how many there are, but they're really going to be great at creating diverse and inclusive references that can be then used um, when a particular individual is looking for a diagnosis and they have a particular variant, it, it's more helpful to look at that very that variant in the context of a genome that's more representative of their ancestry. Um, so a variant that's rare in one population might actually be common in another and vice versa. Um, so this is a really interesting area, both in terms of clinical application, but there's lots of um, bioinformatics development that needs to happen. So how do we represent um, graph-based pan genomes? Um, how do we adapt our tools to be able to use them? Um, how do we adapt the Ensemble Genome Browser to display pan genomes is something we're actively working on. 
Um, so I think this is an area that has very broad interest and um, I'm really excited to see sort of where we are maybe five, 10 years from now. Yeah, that sounds like a really exciting space. It could really change the way that people approach this type of research as well. Oh, definitely, yeah. You mentioned earlier that the EBI has a big focus on training. Where can people find training on the different resources that you've mentioned today? That's a great question, Melissa. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I know you used to be part of that You're team. Right time to um, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, there is one main um, EBI training website. It's actually a really great resource. Uh, they revamped it um, maybe a year or two ago, um, and it contains all back catalog of all of training that has been recorded, um, training materials that uh, people can follow on their own, um, sort of like walkthrough guides. Um, and you can also search it. So you can search it for um, human genomics or human or genomic data or whatever sort of area you want, and you can see recorded webinars. Um, it also, I think, displays uh, future courses that are open for attendance. Um, we still do a good mix of um, on-site, um, like full five-day courses um, or one-off webinars. Um, so it's a really great resource for finding um, things that you want to learn more about. And I believe it's also cross-referenced with um, Elixir has uh, something called the oh, training... I forget what it's, it's called TESS, T-E-S-S. -S. Um, it's another training platform. And I think it links out more broadly, not just to EBI, but training across Elixir that's available um, for a topic that you want. So that's another resource I would recommend checking out. Okay, so I think we will leave it there for today. Thank you so much, Mallory, for sharing your time with us and telling us about a variety of different resources that are available at the EBI and globally for human genomics research. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this is just part of a series of different training events that we offer. You can find out more about these on the BioCommons website or through our social media channels. And generally you can keep up to date with the things that we've been up to and what's happening around Australia by subscribing to our newsletter. Thank you again, Mallory, for joining us today. I will finish by acknowledging that Australian BioCommons is enabled by ANCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Thanks everyone for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and we will see you again soon. Until then, goodbye for now and enjoy your weekend. <laughs>